This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. My name is Shani Garcia Sims, and I'm a genealogist at Shakespeare's Library in Rhode Island. And I am going to present Dr. Kat Atkinson, who is doing some research on Kathleen Williams, a journal that we found, and it was a mystery how we mystery of how we saved it. But I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca, and this is a journal about how many pages about Kathleen Williams and Rebecca. Come here, Rebecca, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, this is the Thrill of a lifetime to see this. When we first saw this, my cat body lost my mind because I was jumping up and down and clapping and screaming. Because here is absolute proof of where Kathy ended up. And uh, to read this journal so that you can see it, you'll notice it's striking because the main entry is Catherine Williams, male, 48 question mark, servant, Trinidad, Colorado. Written over that is William Cathy, or is it the other way? We don't know for sure. Um, William Cathy was admitted September 26, 1896. Discharged, transferred to the state asylum April 18, 1897. Unimproved. No, don't have any family history because she had no family. Um, personal history, servant during the late war, meaning the Indian Wars. Feet were frozen while he was wandering in an attack of delirium, toes amputated uh, during a fought, which is consistent with what Kathy said. Um, there was an ill thought out campaign against the Apaches in the winter of 1867. Uh, a lot of the soldiers of the 38th Company A with Williams were frost bitten and suffered very badly. The uh, Buffalo soldiers got the worst costumes, the worst clothing, the worst food, and they were ill-equipped to be out for almost two weeks on a forced march. They weren't allowed to have fire because they were afraid the Indians would be alerted to their presence. And so this is consistent with um, records of the time. So I do believe that that is probably what caused the damage to her feet, not diabetes as so many people think. Um, her condition at this time, uh, male, colored, docile, industrious, fixed delusions of persecution. Diagnosis, chronic mania. Progress, no improvement. Transferred again to the state hospital for 18-1898. Now, at first, I thought this had to be a mistake because there's two different transfers to the hospital. But then I discovered a week ago, it isn't because this is when she apparently left to go to Leadville, where she had maybe her cousin or an acquaintance, and acted crazily in a bar, saying that she had, was actually always a male, and that she had only pretended to be a woman. Um, and some other crazy stories about people following her and other things. Um, and so she was uh, judged and seen then at uh, Leadville and sent back to Trinidad, where she went to court again and was recommitted to the state hospital. That seems to be the actual timeline of events. I haven't found anything else, although I wish I would, to show that she ever got out again. So I believe that she was there until she died in 1911. And that that was the person, William Catherine, um, kind of a clerical error on census reading that they saw Kathy as our uh, comma instead of her name, Kathy. Um, so I believe that she is that person that is buried um, in a poppy grave at Wisdom. I'm Rebecca Atkinson, and I once was a librarian here at Buffalo City County Library District, so it's my pleasure to come back and share some of my new research on the only documented female Buffalo soldier, Kathy Williams. 
Um, Kathy has been um, the subject of a lot of new interest, um, but she's had a lot of interest for years. And uh, one example of this is uh, some of these books on her life. Uh, the William Tucker, the one on the far left, is the only full-length book on Kathy Williams. Uh, and then she's in a lot of other books too because of her, um, because of the increased interest in Buffalo Soldiers. She's unusual in so many ways. Uh, we don't have her viewpoint anywhere else, um, perhaps in the West, because she is a black woman. She was illiterate, so she couldn't leave anything behind herself. Um, and she was on the frontier. She was in the infantry when she was a Buffalo soldier, which is unusual. Most of our accounts of Buffalo soldiers are the horse soldiers. Those are the romantic ones you always hear about, but she was in the infantry. Um, they also redesigned the military units for black soldiers and considerably consolidated them. So she was in a unit, the uh, 38th Company A, that was the very first infantry unit um, formed in St. Louis, Missouri, and later it was consolidated into the 25th Infantry. So there aren't records for very long even of her, um, of that, of that time, of the military at that time. Um, but there are considerable military records and uh, government documents. So that's the main way we've been able to find out anything about her newspaper accounts, uh, especially the interview she did with a correspondent from the St. Louis Times in 1876 in Trinidad. She was kind of a local character, and that is the only time that she got to tell her story. She swore the reporter to tell what she said accurately, and he did. And he also described her, described his impressions of her, so we know a lot more about how she looked, how she carried herself, um, what, just what kind of a person she is, and what her voice was like. But her voice as a black woman, let alone soldier and businesswoman in the frontier, that's not a voice you get very often. And that does not count her service in the Civil War for almost since the beginning of the war in the summer of 1861 when she was liberated by the forces under uh, General Lyon at Jefferson City. She was actually at that time working on a farm for a William Johnson. She was his servant, along with a few other servants, and she was liberated uh, by the Union forces, taken somewhat against her will because she was a teenage girl and terrified, but they were looking for cooks. They desperately needed cooks. A lot of soldiers died because of the bad food that they ate. That was the number one cause of illness and disease not being shot to death, as one might anticipate. Anyway, they were looking for cooks, and because she was a house girl, they assumed she could cook. They were wrong, but she did go to uh, cook's training and in Arkansas and did become an extremely good cook, apparently, because she was a cook for generals before the Civil War ended. Um, but Kathy um, was a little afraid to do this, but then before you knew it, she was a, a, conscripted, a conscripted concubine, uh, contraband, I'm sorry, contraband. Uh, status. Missouri, uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, some of the border states that had Union slaveholders and Confederate slaveholders, uh, they had different rules. So if the Confederacy was going to use these slaves, they could take them to dig ditches, to do laundry, to cook, to do any task that they needed done. This is before soldiers could be, uh, black men could be soldiers. And so Kathy was uh, taken um, and was considered contraband, which means at any time during the war, had she been captured, she would have been sold back into slavery, taken back. Um, so, and that was a constant fear of many of these people. Um, but she, just for her Civil War years, I think that she deserves some recognition. And that is why I've been working on, on her story for over a decade trying to research it, trying to find out what happened to her. And a lot of what happened to her turns out to be, uh, it happened in Pueblo, Colorado. So that is uh, something we'll look at. Okay, um, I'm not the first person, of course, who's been interested in Kathy Williams. Um, 
as I say, she's the subject of all kinds of articles, scholarly articles in the West, feminist articles, different things like that. She also um, has been uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, the National Multicultural Western Heritage Hall of Fame um, in 20, uh, 2007. There is a historic marker because of her at the last fort uh, she served at Fort Cummings, New Mexico, as a Buffalo soldier. There has been quite a bit of art created about her for various things. And the interesting thing to me is that there are motorcycle clubs of veterans all over the United States that are see her as their uh, their their group. Uh, forget the word, like in a sports event when you have somebody. Mascot. mascot, thank you. She's their mascot. And actually, when I was doing a uh, presentation here at Pueblo Library, I actually had been asked to come and do something on homesteading women, which is another interest of mine, hence the dress. Um, I actually had these folks come from Denver and Colorado Springs who are members of a uh, Buffalo Soldier Motorcycle Club and know everything about Kathy Williams. So they had actually come um, to see me. So I ended up doing an impromptu uh, session on her as well because they had thought that's why I was here. Now, this is where we found the information at Pueblo Library that helps us know what happened, what's the rest of her story. What happened after she asked for help? See, in Trinidad, her feet began to bother her. The horrible thing is that she, the fronts of both feet were amputated. All toes and half of one of the feet were amputated. She said because of uh, frostbite because of damage she had on the trail, um, but that she was refused any kind of uh, compensation or really a military disability, even though she had an honorable discharge. Um, and so nobody knows what happened to her. People have assumed all this time that it must have been diabetes for her to lose all her toes. Therefore, she probably had it when she joined as a Buffalo soldier in 1866. She probably already had this condition, and therefore she did not deserve a disability, except that's wrong. Um, probably, uh, and I, I think I'll be able to show that because she lived for so much longer than people realized, she could not have had rampant, untreated diabetes. So um, how I got the clue about what happened to her happened one day at the library here when we received several boxes of donations. In these boxes, in these boxes were two journals, very old medical journals from the Woodcroft uh, Sanatorium, which was a sort of experimental hospital uh, for veterans and people with nervous disorders uh, that was started here in Pueblo. And it, in the first case book, the skinny little book, which we'll be looking at later, is an entry for Kathy Williams and William Cather, her other name. Uh, this was written up in the Pueblo Chieftain at the time we made the discovery. Um, this is a copy of the article from the St. Louis News that tells so much about her. This is where we had the information that turns out to be pretty accurate, everything she said before the discovery of this journal that helps us know the rest of her story. Um, What's interesting about this one is she tells us her background, and I check out several of these things. She said, my father was a freeman, but my mother a slave, belonging to William Johnson, a wealthy farmer who lived the time I was born near Independence, Missouri. While I was a small girl, the family moved to Jefferson City. My master died there right before the war. And then she talks about her being taken uh, by the Union troops. Captain Clark is actually the one she ended up with. Her travels all through the Civil War, she was in one of the biggest battles of the West at Pea Ridge. 
Um, she was up and down the coast, as far down as Savannah, Georgia, up the Mississippi on a rail uh, on a riverboat. Um, at the time of the right before uh, Richmond, the Battle of Vicksburg, and that kind of thing was going on. She was sent then to the Shenandoah Valley under General Sherman. Became rose to the point of being not just Captain Clark's cook, but being uh, Sherman's cook, and so and and housekeeper, laundress, that kind of thing. She kind of took care of him at, at camp. Um, so that was really a, a he was the second most important general in the Civil War behind Ulysses S. Grant and I guess Sherman. Uh, so the third most important, perhaps. So at that time, that was quite a position to be in from an illiterate teenage slave girl to the cook for generals is not, not bad. Um, then she talks about her time in the uh, Buffalo Soldiers the, when she joined. An interesting thing for me is that she when she joined, she joined with two other men. She joined with her cousin and uh, a special friend, which at the usage of the time was probably a boyfriend. And they joined together and these guys were with her. They never revealed her secret until she was ready to tell. And so they were with her apparently um, the whole time. I suspect that one of them could be buried with her here in Pueblo in Roselawn uh, Cemetery. Um, there is another Williams who uh, also was in the military, who's also in the Pockers field. I think recently his grave has been acknowledged, but Kathy, has not. And so um, hopefully people will become interested in making sure that she gets the honor that she deserves. She didn't get a lot of respect in her life, but she deserves respect now because she is a one of a kind, unique uh, person um, and very important. So uh, she talks about what happened to her in Pueblo here. She actually, after she got out of the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, she worked as for a lot of families in Pueblo. Uh, she was a laundress, she was a cook, she helped with cleaning. One funny occasion, she was house sitting for a, a beautiful uh, young white girl. Men came to serenade the white girl outside her house and they were quite surprised when Kathy came out and everybody had a good laugh. She was the only one home. And uh, she had a great sense of humor. People all talk about that in Trinidad and other places, but she was kind of a beloved figure. She did well for business. She bought a, a horse and wagon uh, team for her laundry business. Uh, she had a gold watch and chain. She had money in the bank. Um, and she married a man who could have been a minor. Um, and he ran off with her money. So she turned him into the police. And then she ended up going to Trinidad, where she opened her business and did well there for quite, quite a long time. She always did this because she wanted to be independent and she didn't want to be a burden to her family and friends. That was the most important thing to Kathy, is to be independent. You can imagine being a slave, how important it would be to be independent, to get to make your own choices, where you lived, what you did. Even as just in a freed black woman, she could not have a lot of choice on what to do. Her options for employment were very limited uh, she was actually at physical risk of attack, rape, that kind of thing, um, happened a lot. Um, so she sometimes apparently thought it was smarter to assume a male identity so she could have a job, get around, and have her freedom, which is what mattered to her, her independence. She was born in Independence, Missouri, speaking of irony, uh, so close to the Kansas line that she could have uh, run away to freedom had she not been just a young girl. Um, this is a, a, a drawing of what they think it looked like in that time, the town of Independence. Kathy said her, her owner died uh, right before the war began. And I discovered that all this time, the researchers had the wrong William Johnson as her owner. The one everybody thinks was her owner is actually a guy that lived. Uh, he was still alive in the 1870 census. But one William Johnson was not, and that is her owner. 
So I actually found this information. You could see the household. There were a lot of kids to take care of, also an aunt. So uh, it tells us quite a bit about who this William Johnson was. Here's a little bit of a closer view of the Johnson family. You can see he's a farmer from Pennsylvania. His wife was from Virginia. We have found her family because this, uh, both William Johnson's in question had a wife named Eliza. So it really does get complicated. But I found this William Johnson's uh, marriage record with Eliza, which told me who her family was. It was a common custom at this time, especially for someone whose family came from Virginia, to, uh, for the girls in the family to be given slaves, house servants, when they marry, and the boys to be given land. So it makes sense that sometime after this marriage, when the family moved, Kathy said when she was a small girl, to Jefferson City, that that's probably how she got to Jefferson City as the servant of Eliza and her family. So that's an important distinction. If that's the case, then she would have been born, as she said, in Independence, probably on the farm of the Dixon farm. Um, that's something I'm hoping to get some photos of. I have discovered where the family cemetery is. The house is gone, of course. Most of those houses along the river were burned down in the Civil War. There aren't that many left, but the cemetery is left. So we can tell a lot more about her. But here again, what she said is, Correct. She's usually pretty accurate. Uh, this is the probate records of her uh, Eliza Dixon Williams or Johnson's house or family estate. Um, so you can see that her father Ebenezer left her land and money, and so that's what gave me some information. Here's a little bit more about her mother, her father, and there is our Eliza Ann Dixon. Mistress of Kathy, I believe. Here is an interesting slave inhabitant schedule, which is about the only way you can tell. Of course, there's no names, but this one uh, would have been about the time that Kathy came to Jefferson City. Notice there is one black female, age six, an older black woman, 35, and a mulatto uh, boy, age 11, which I wonder if that could be her cousin because they uh, seem to have been together about the same time. Her father was a free man, so he was not part of the plantation. Here's some examples of what it was like to be a, a woman at that point, a slave. Uh, the first picture was the woman with the basket. That's actually in Washington, D.C. They still had slavery halfway through the Civil War. And uh, this was a woman outside the slave pens where they were selling slaves. Uh, during the time, Kathy Williams is working with the Union Army to free the slaves. So it's kind of ironic. Uh, beside them are some other women uh, processing pork. This is a similar plantation in size, and it's kind of a famous one, so I was able to go there to where Kathy might have lived. Um, it's actually the uh, plantation of the Dent family, the wife of uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And so it's very similar to what her place might have looked like. Um, here is the basement where they did the laundry and the cooking in that house. Here's the cook. Here are the rules for the day that were posted um, at that museum. This was in 1847, so she was born, we think, about 1842. This would have been the rules that applied to her, such as Negroes and Mulattoes not to be taught to read or write, and other rules. Uh, no free Negro or mulatto to immigrate from the state. Uh, there was punishment for violation of his acts, etc., etc. So there were a lot of rules. This is actually the guy that took uh, Kathy William. Um, back in the volunteers' days, they had a 90-day volunteer day and then became part of an official unit at Jefferson Barracks. Uh, she actually was with the 8th Indiana almost her entire time in the Civil War. And this is the guy that came and got her. This is the few buildings that still remain from uh, Jefferson City that Kathy might have known. 
Um, one of them was a store at the time, and it's right beside the railroad tracks where she would have been uh, put on a train uh, to go with the troops to their next station. This is an example of uh, many, many servants that were these contraband servants. And this is an example of a couple of the uh, laundresses and, and some of the men that would have been in the same position that she was, actually working for the Union Army. They were not paid, but they got rations and a place to live. And then later in the war, they were paid. Um, so that was a big incentive to her. And some other laundresses with their children. This is uh, Sherman's a wagon train, a huge numbers of people. Some of the Civil War battles had 20, 30,000 people at the battle. So huge numbers of people were in these wagon trains. And she would go with her wash tubs, with her cooking supplies, probably walking, um, and, and managed to get to the uh, campsite before everybody else did, set it all up, get the food going, and that was her job. So it was really quite a, people say, well, you know, maybe she was always feeble. That's what they tried to say when they found out she was a woman and kicked her out of the military. But uh, she couldn't have been that feeble and walked thousands of miles and carried those gigantic cans and, and gigantic wash tubs and uh, do all that work that she did do for four years during the Civil War. Uh, a lot of men did not survive. A lot of men got diseases and died. And uh, somehow she made it through all of that uh, and did well. So I don't, I dispute the fact that she was weak. Um, also, she was quite a large, strong woman for her time. She was set on her um, enlistment papers to be um, five foot eight or nine. And so uh, she was well muscled. When she went into that recruiting office in Jefferson, in a, at Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, they just took one look at her and saw this tall, for the day, uh, strong, well-muscled man, and that was the end of it. Um, they didn't do, they were so desperate for troops, they didn't do a lot of close inspection, despite what they said, so she was found to be a strapping young man and perfectly uh, physically capable of being a soldier. So this is how she got that way, by all of this walking all through the Civil War. Here's an example of another uh, black man who was a cook. And this is one of my favorites. I wish I had a picture like this of Kathy, but here I have a picture of another woman who was a servant to General Fritz Porter and his staff. Very similar situation to what Kathy had with Sherman. And uh, so I like this picture of Mrs. Fairfax, chief cook and bottle washer, because that was what Kathy was. Here's something I found, and going through some things um, National Archives, they actually had a uh, group of photographs from the Civil War of contraband servants. And so I just flipped through there, and then I saw Sherman. Or Sheridan. I saw General Sheridan in a, in a picture and says it's from the Army of the Potomac Headquarters, Brandy Station, Virginia. And then I started looking at the servant standing behind him. He's very distinctive looking. So who is that woman serving these guys? You can see she's, you know, not the most feminine looking girl, really. Um, very short hair, but that's definitely a woman, a young woman, who meets her description in just about every way. And you can tell for sure that that is General Philip Sheridan. He always wore a certain kind of hat. He was uh, quite a short man, especially in the legs, a certain mustache. There's no doubt that that's him. So who is that taking care of him right when she was supposed to be there at um, in the Shenandoah Valley at the time. I think this is her. Unfortunately, it's not labeled, so we'll never know. Not only was she sort of the aide de camp to him, but to all of his officers. She cooked and did laundry for them and took care of them also. And you'll notice that one of them is pretty famous. That would be uh, George Armstrong Custer, was one of the people she took care of. Ironically, as a Buffalo soldier, she'd be under his brother Tom. So this is fascinating how these people keep intersecting. 
uh, Sheridan would also lean to try to subdue the Indians in the West, so he was out there too at the same time. Now this is the Battle of Pea Ridge, where uh, uh, it was quite a, it was quite an important battle and quite terrifying. Had she been captured at any time, and um, she would have went back home or perhaps just been shot. Then after the war, she saw that they were enlisting black men into the military and that there were these flyers around and, and that's when her friend and her cousin came and told her about it. This is uh, Jefferson Barracks. There aren't, aren't many of the original buildings left, but this is the armory that would have been there when she was there. And here's her enlistment papers. This is an example of what she would have done out in the West. They escorted all the mail coaches and things because the Santa Fe Trail, which is where she uh, worked as a soldier, was uh, under dual attack. It had been um, under attack in the Civil War, but then it was under attack by angry Native Americans after Sand Creek and things like that. Um, that's just a very short time after, after she came out. So they would actually walk or ride the coaches and, and secure the trail. So she would have been doing a lot of that. This is Fort Bayard uh, at what it looked like during Kathy's time, including the hospital condition in the forefront where she began to get sick. Now what had happened to her is she missed going west with the rest of her, of her the company A and 38 because she got a bad case of smallpox at Jefferson's Barracks. A lot of these ex-slaves had never been around that many people. They lived such isolated lives. And so when they came in contact with lots of people, uh, they often got diseases. And she got this horrible case of smallpox. So she had to leave after everybody else and catch up with them. Um, there was a train to ride part of the way um, but then from Leavenworth on, she, it was pretty much on foot, and she went all the way to New Mexico, uh, caught up with her people there, and then they all marched to New Mexico. So it was a long way to march. She was still sick from having smallpox, um, you know, had to swim rivers and all of this kind of thing. And so she blamed that for the loss of her hearing and maybe the start of some of her problems. She wasn't sure. But... Um, she, that was a big disadvantage. It did mar her skin, and so she had uh, small pox, pox scars from that, and it really sapped her strength. So you can imagine how, how bad that would have been. She was so sick, she was three weeks in the hospital with smallpox, and then had to catch up on her own. Um, this is the returns, the actual records from the fort when, they, when she had been discovered as a female, and they kicked her out. Uh, they said she was feeble-minded and all of this stuff, but she did get an honorable discharge. She never had a black mark on her record the whole time she was a soldier, and she was really proud of that. Um, here's a close-up of, of that. This is uh, her, more on her disability papers. And then, she, where did she go? A spot that after they kicked her out, um, she had become maybe a cook for an officer in Fort Union. And then the next place she shows up, which I just found this out recently, is uh, Los Alamos, Colorado. There were Buffalo soldiers uh, stationed at nearby Fort Lyon, and it's possible that's why she went there. But she did go to and open a laundry business of some kind in um, Los Alamos, Colorado. So I'm hoping to find more about that. Went from there apparently to Pueblo, from Pueblo to Trinidad, and then she's going to be back in Pueblo again um, once she becomes uh, disabled. But this woman is was fought by Ruth Steele at the Martin Luther King uh, Museum and, and Heritage Center here, first black orphanage uh, west of the Mississippi here in Pueblo. She thought that Kathy might have worked for uh, them or her mother. That's a common thought, that it was her mother, Martha. We have no clue that she and Martha ever reconnected again. Many slaves were never able to reconnect with their family. We have no evidence at all of that happening. 
I think this was probably Kathy Williams because she is tall. The, the reporter said black as night, very dark, complected uh, woman. And so I think that this could have been her at the original orphanage, which was stone, as opposed to the new one, which is uh, brick. So yes, it was in front of a window at the orphanage, but I think it was the first one. She could have been doing sewing or some services for the orphans at the orphanage. Um, another thing is that the sanitarium she ends, at, ends up at, the Woodcroft Sanitarium, is very close to the new side of the orphanage. So it's possible that she did go back and forth over there, but I don't think that she or her mother ever actually were matrons or lived there, as has been rumored. There's a lot of rumors and not been much fact but this is um, what I believe is the truth. You can see in this close-up, I think it's her because of two things. One, this woman has scars, although it's a little hard to see, round scars on her face that could be smallpox. Um, she's kind of masculine looking. She has the hat. Kathy was known in Trinidad for having a different hat for every occasion that she made herself. She was kind of a seamstress, she had a sewing machine, and, and did that, and so this seems like this very well could be her. Here is her census data for Trinidad. So we know she was in Trinidad by June 1880. And in fact, the newspaper article about her was came out in January 1876, but actually um, was done in 1875, in December. So we know she had been in Trinidad for quite a while at this time. There's a picture of Trinidad at about that period. Um, there's a lot of wrong information about her. Um, this is another example. Uh, historian William Lauren Katz claims this is Ka uh, Kathy Williams working in her garden. Um, she wanted to have her own land. She said she was going to get her own land, which she was entitled to as a veteran. She would get so much uh, time off. Um, so she was planning to do that as soon as the train came to Trinidad, but something prevented it, and I believe that what prevented it is she had continual trouble with her feet until um, they had to be amputated. So I, this is not her. He also has the dates of her service and some other things wrong, so it's just not right. I did go and find out if she ever got that homestead claim and was able to talk with the Bureau of Land Management people up in Denver. And they were able to confirm that a Catherine Williams did take out a true claim about that time. But on further research in the Trinidad city directories, I found that actually there was another Catherine Williams, a white young girl, who very likely filed for that claim. I was able to get the actual signature from the, the claim filing, and it's, I doubt that Kathy wrote that um, because she was illiterate. I think it's the other girl. So I'm putting two and two together. They probably lived within a block of each other and lived there at the same time. But one was Miss, Miss Kate Williams, and the other one was Kate Williams. So she applied then for, once or after she had been in the hospital for a year after the amputation of all the toes, uh, she applied for disability because she couldn't work and she was a physical laborer. She, I, it's a wonder she could even stand, but she did get to the point where she could walk with canes apparently. Um, but she applied, she had, was illiterate, so she just went with whatever the lawyers that were assigned to her in Washington, D.C. said, and they did not even mention that her feet were her main problem. They said it was that she was deaf and some other things. They totally messed it up. Um, they had to review it several times, so it went through about a three-stage process. They denied her every time. They even had a lawyer come out, or a doctor come out to her house in Trinidad, her little adobe shanty on First Street in Trinidad, um, and he noted that she had no fronts to her feet, but otherwise she seemed hale and hearty, big and strong woman. Um, clearly knew nothing, never really examined her, um, and concluded that she didn't deserve the disability pension. So you can see all the stamps of rejection and all this going on. His statements. 
Um, so after that, there was this article that came out from Friends of Hers that talked about her state of destitution. It says Catherine Williams, better known as Nigger Kate, says the Trinidad advertiser is lying very sick at her shanty on West First Street, and in destituted circumstances, having been for several days without fire or food. And he talked about how everybody knew her in Pueblo and Trinidad, how well thought of she was, and how he hoped people would help her. And apparently somebody did, because sometime after this, she was transported to Pueblo to the Wood Cross Sanitarium as William Kathy, because as with her uh, certificate of uh, honorable discharge, she took that and was able to get into the Wood Cross Sanitarium. That was in 1896. She made it until 1897 when they decided that she was, in fact, that he, in fact, was a sheep. At that point, they decided she was crazy, delusional, and sent her to the state mental hospital. This much we do know. Um, I found document documentation to prove all of that, and also the Wood Cross uh, ledger states that that's what happened. So people did help her. This is the Wood Cross entry, but we'll look at a better version of that. Uh, found some information on the Wood Cross uh, Sanitarium because that hospital is no longer here, hasn't been here for a long time, uh, but it was registered as a historic site. This is what's left, nothing pretty much. There's, it was burned by a big fire. Um, one would have thought all the records were destroyed, but apparently not because some of them ended up in the basement of the historic Vale Hotel here in Pueblo, and those were what we received as a donation. She went to the state hospital. She is listed in 1900 among its inmates. She is also listed in 1910. So would someone really be sent to the state mental hospital because they said they were a man when in fact they were a woman? Well, it happened to more than one person, and here is the most, uh, I think, telling example. Albert D.J. Cashier was an uh, Irish immigrant who served at, Sh at Shiloh in some of the most bloody battles in the Civil War, served with honor and distinction the whole Civil War. Um, as a veteran, he was allowed to go into a, veteran, a veteran's home in Illinois, and uh, taken care of there for quite some time um, until, unfortunately, he was out helping around the grounds, was accidentally hit by somebody, kind of run over, and they discovered that Albert was a woman. At that point, Albert was taken away um, to the state hospital. Albert would be forced to wear a dress, fell down some steps and was injured, this soldier that had been through all of these horrible battles in the Civil War had, and really couldn't earn a living as a woman, he had tried, um, so was, you know, defeated by being sent to this hospital and forced to wear a dress. It's just crazy. Um, a lot of people that served with Albert came forward and said what a good soldier Albert had been. Um, here's a picture of Albert right before the disaster happened of his of her discovery, and so she died not long after being uh, sent to this hospital. Kathy Williams, however, apparently lived for at least 13 years after being sent to the hospital. Um, here we have a funeral notice that I believe is of Kathy Williams. She was labeled in the census data as Cather instead of Kathy. So that's why the spelling, she would not, not have known that. Maybe um, whoever helped with this funeral didn't know it either. McMahon and Collier Chapel did the service. They did charity burials for those that died at the state hospital. And she was interned at Rose Lawn Cemetery, where she still is. This is a record from Rose Lawn Cemetery. 
I had looked before under William Cathy and Catherine Williams and every variation I could think of. Never tried Cather. And when I found this, I was pretty excited. Where the shadow of this tree is, is, is where I believe that she is buried. And it's been confirmed to me now that someone by that name is buried there. So we'll see. Um, Roselawn Cemetery. Here marks the spot where she is at Roselawn. And uh, that's some of my supporting material. I'm still working on this. I actually am on a trip to Missouri starting Friday to try to find some more information on Kathy Williams. And uh, I was uh, selected as a research scholar by the Santa Fe Trail Association to work on Kathy Williams. And uh, so I've been researching that. I recently found some information just a week ago that I have not included anywhere else yet. But it actually explains that Williams was in the Woodcroft Hospital in 1826. She was let out 5-5-1897 uh, and apparently headed to Leadville, where I believe this cousin or another um, black veteran named Williams may have been living. Apparently, she acted very erratically there in, in, uh, in Leadville. Um, it said on in the Fair Play Flume of 5-7, uh, 1897, Williams has been adjudged insane at Leadville. He is a colored man who for 15 years has passed unsuspected as a woman, working for many Pueblo families as a laundress. Now, she's the one that said she was, um, had been pretending to be a woman. So, and she also was adjudged insane for uh, various other pretty crazy remarks she made at the time. So, at this point, she, I believe she really believed with her whole heart that she was William Cathy. For whatever reason, that's who she was. And that was enough to get you put away for the rest of your life, having the same person in the 1890s. Um, so we did find that information. This is actually from the Pueblo County Insane Asylum, some records that were on uh, the internet, which I did find. So this further substantiates that that indeed was Kathy Williams, and that's the rest of her story. Uh, my hope is that people will know what she did and, and honor her for her unique insight and the amazing things she did. Um, at that time, and that we can get a memorial to her at Rose Lawn and get the record set straight that she did deserve the disability, and that's what uh, should have happened. And I just wanted to have the respect in death, at least, that she didn't get it.